Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and for choosing to spend the first beautiful Sunday in modern British history indoors. Um, so I like to say that the, the gateway drug for making is breaking. That is to say that every act of making begins with an act of unmaking. You know, my uh, first experience with writing was in 1977, and my dad loaded the family onto our Brontosaurus and took us into town to see Star Wars. And uh, people rhapsodize today about Star Wars as though it were the greatest film ever made. And I think it's a moderately good film, but what, what it had and what electrified me about it in 1977 was that it was complicated. And in 1977, in the days before DVD players and VHS decks, and in the days before cable telly, uh, in Canada, you got a couple, three channels, and the children's programming on it was, was really unchallenging. It was sort of Teletubbies level, right up to the, you know, sort of late adolescence. And as a consequence, I'd never seen a story that was complicated enough to, uh, to, to really excite me, to, to let me know what the potentials were for stories. And after I saw Star Wars and saw a story where there were reversals and um, plot twists and multiple points of view and a non-chronological storytelling, I went home and stapled together uh, scrap paper and trimmed it out to the size of a paperback novel and I just wrote out Star Wars over and over again like a kid practicing scales on the piano trying to take it apart and see how it works. And this became the template not just for my history of making but I think for a generation's history of making because of course a few years later along came personal computers that did virtually nothing unless you took apart the programs that came with them, because they came with, with programs in BASIC whose source code could be listed out, and rewrote that code, usually breaking it in some important way, and then figuring out how you'd broken it and putting it back together again. Uh, Mr. Jalopy, who many of you will have read uh, in Make Magazine, is the best mechanic I know, and the way he became a mechanic was by buying $100 junkers in Los Angeles and, and realizing that it didn't matter how badly he broke them because, after all, they were only $100 to begin with and not in running order, and so he, he was free to break them as much as he wanted. Um, you know, the best way to double your success rate is to triple your failure rate. The best way to triple your failure rate is to make failure as cheap as possible. This idea that um, we, we take things apart that the people before us have made and then we put them back together in ways that suit our hands is not a new one. It's one that's as old as the Enlightenment. It's one that's, that's as old as the idea of standing on the shoulders of giants as the means by, by which progress takes place. And um, the, uh, that process always, as a necessity, involves copying. It involves taking what someone made before you, copying it, varying it and copying it on further. Copying is really built in to who we are and, and how we conduct our lives. Um, when my daughter was born uh, here in London in Hackney, my parents came over from Canada for a visit to, to meet their new granddaughter. And my mom, her doctorate is in early childhood education. She's really good with little kids. We call her the baby whisperer. And, and when she came to our flat in, in Hackney uh, when my daughter was about a week and a half old. She said, have you stuck your tongue out at her yet? And I said, no, mom, I, I haven't stuck my tongue out yet at my newborn. Why would I do such a thing? And before I tell you what happened next, I have to mention, in case you haven't been around a newborn lately, at that age, a week, two weeks old, they know they have a tongue, but not the way you and I know we have a tongue. They haven't really seen themselves in a mirror yet. They may have touched themselves, but not in any systematic way. They lack that coordination. And yet, my mom, she picked up her granddaughter in her arms like this and went. And my daughter, she looked back up at her grandmother and she did this. Because we copy like we nuzzle for the breast, it's built in. After all, four billion years ago, thanks to a process we don't entirely understand, molecules started to reproduce themselves. And we are the descendants of those things that reproduce themselves well. We know what happens to things that don't reproduce themselves. We have a name for them, we call them extinct. Copying is a feature and not a bug. Copying is the means by which civilization conducts itself. And yet the law acts as though copying were a bug and not a feature. Uh, the European Union Copyright Directive uh, makes it a crime to remove locks from devices that you own even if you are not in any other way breaking the law. So if you have a device that's locked so that it only uh, will run software from the App Store that Apple made, or so that it will only run DVDs from a certain region, or so that it will only run games that Nintendo has published, or so um, it won't allow you to save streams that come in from the web 
uh, we have this funny distinction we make between streams and downloading. Have you noticed this? That we, we say, oh, I didn't download it, I only got a stream. As though there was some way by which your computer could receive video images without downloading them. As though the internet were made of mirrors, perhaps, by which these pictures were shone, you know, through, through the internet onto your screen without a copy being made. A, a stream is just a copy that doesn't have a save as button. Um, and so we sometimes have computers with software or hardware locks to stop you from saving those video files. And the law, thanks to the European Union Copyright Directive, makes it a crime to remove those locks or to tell people how to remove those locks or to give people information that they might use to remove those locks. And that's uh, part of a, a, a global uh, regime of, of, of copyright law. Uh, in 1996, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the UN agency that makes copyright law and has the same relationship to bad copyright that Mordor has to evil, uh, created a, a treaty called the WIPO Copyright Treaty. And all over the world, this has now been enacted in law. In the United States, it came in as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA of 1998. Those of you who haunt online maker boards will have heard people railing about the DMCA. In the UK, it came in through the European Union Copyright Directive in 2000 to 2002. In Canada, where I'm from, we passed this last year in Bill C-11. This is amazing, right? To, to pass a law making it illegal to look inside a computer in 1998 may be forgivable lack of foresight, but to do this in 2012 is just felony stupidity. Um, and yet this has become a feature of law all around. Now, um, this has lots of strange consequences, making it illegal to remove a software lock. For one thing, it makes it illegal for makers to sell or give things to people who want them. So say you've made some software for an Apple iOS device, right? You've written a program that runs on it. You have made an original copyrighted work that is yours. And you wanna sell it to me or just give it to me. But Apple doesn't wanna put it in the App Store. The only way I can install that on my device is by jailbreaking it, by removing the software locks. And the law prohibits this. In the name of defending creators, the law says that you can't sell or give your creation to me unless a multinational corporation whose sole contribution to your creativity is to have assembled some skinny electronics in a South Pacific sweatshop and then hidden the income somewhere in the Irish Sea says that you're allowed to. Now that's, that's bad enough. Um, but that's only the first order consequence of this regime of software locks and special protections for them to makers. Now, when you think about it, a software lock on a device is a really strange thing because it's a kind of anti-feature. Nobody wants a computer that is locked against them, right? Nobody wants to own a device that when you ask it to do something, it says no. When we tell our computers, copy this file, uh, pipe this, this uh, stream into that file, um, run this program, we expect our computers to say yes, master. We really don't want them to say, I can't let you do that, Dave. Right? That's, that's really like not a feature anybody wants. And so in order to make that anti-feature run on a computer, the computer has to be designed so that it, it hides things from its owner. After all, if there was just an icon on the desktop of your computer that was labeled hal9000.app or .exe, you would drag it into the trash. Nobody wants that feature on their program. If it's visible, we get rid of it. And so the only way to make that work is if there are some files that your computer can't even see, right? If you say, computer, tell me which files are in this directory. If, it, if, it's, if there's a HAL 9000 program, it lies to you about whether it's there. Same thing with process monitors. Your computer has to be designed so that if you ask your computer what programs are running, and there's a program running that you don't want there, your computer has to be designed to lie to you about whether it's there. This is why when Sony tried to stop people from copying their audio CDs in 2005, they um, shipped their uh, six million audio CDs with a program that copied itself over illicitly and without your permission silently to your computer and changed your operating system so that if there were any files on that, on that computer that started with dollar sign, SYS dollar sign, that your computer wouldn't see them. And if they're running as programs, the process monitor couldn't see them. Uh, that uh, went on to infect computers all over the world, including 3, 300,000 U.S. military and government networks. And as soon as that happened, virus writers started prepending all of their virus programs with dollar sign SOS dollar sign. Because, of course, when you blow a hole in the immune system, parasitic infections opportunistically rush in to live there. Once you put a moat in a computer's eye, every illicit thing will go and hide in there. Now, it is illegitimate 
to design computers to hide things from their owners for lots of reasons. Um, but most importantly, because we live in a world that is made of computers, even old buildings like this are fundamentally just computers that we put bodies and art treasures into. When you remove the computers from buildings like this, they very quickly become uninhabitable. And if you keep the computers out of them for any length of time, they will be never inhabitable again without heroic effort. Cars these days are just computers that you cram your body into and that hurtle down the road at 60 miles an hour with you trapped inside of them, surrounded by other people likewise trapped inside of their computers, likewise hurtling down the road at 60 miles an hour. Um, we not only put our bodies into computers, we increasingly put our computers into our bodies. If you're younger than me and grew up with the iPod, or if you're my age or older and grew up with the Walkman, you will have logged sufficient um, uh, punishing earbud hours that come the day you will have a hearing aid and that hearing aid, unless you are some kind of weird retro hipster, will not be a beige plastic analog transistorized device. It will be a general purpose computer that you put in your body. And we have no model for making a computer that runs every program that we can express, except for the program that upsets a lawmaker. The only model we have for that is a computer that runs every program but has spyware on it that watches to see what you're doing and tries to stop you from doing something that has upset someone. So designing computers that hide things from their owners is never a legitimate goal because those, those uh, design decisions redound into realms that go beyond computers, that go beyond the desktops, the laptops, the phones, as dangerous as those are to start selectively breaking. Um, it starts to affect things like our homes, our cars, and our bodies themselves. Everything we do today involves computers and everything we do tomorrow will require them. And lest you think that this all sounds like science fiction, this is already a problem. Computers that do things that their owners don't know about and that they don't approve of is already a huge problem and, a, and an increasing one. So for example, last year in Australia in November, a researcher named Barnaby Jack gave a presentation on the work he's been doing on implanted defibrillators. Now, these are amazing technology. I don't know if you've ever, if you know anyone who has them, but if your heart starts to give out and loses the rhythm periodically, your doctor can fit you with, a, with an implanted defibrillator. She anesthetizes you, she spreads your ribs, she reaches into your chest and attaches a computer with a battery to your heart. And it listens to your heart beating. And if your heart loses the rhythm, it gives it a shock that puts it back into rhythm and keeps you alive. And doctors, well, they want to listen to the telemetry from that computer. They want to find out how it's operating. They want to update its firmware. And it's very hard to do that by means of a cable when the device they're trying to access is inside your chest cavity. So these devices have wireless uh, interfaces. Everything has a wireless interface. It's 2013. The public sphere has become a microwave oven. And so um, Barnaby Jack, from 30 feet away, discovered that he could detect the signature of your wireless pacemaker, your wireless defibrillator, and that he could rewrite its operating system from 30 feet away to seek out other implanted defibrillators and rewrite their operating systems and then deliver lethal shocks to their owners. So not knowing what's going on inside your computer, an injunction that makes it illegal to tell people about how computers work, as an injunction against uh, breaking digital locks necessarily is, is already a matter of life and death. It's already a matter of life and death um, uh, and already a matter of, of significant personal security for all the victims of the sextortionists, uh, that is not extortionist, it's sextortionists, who were arrested by the FBI in America last year. Sextortion consists of hijacking someone's computer, usually a young woman, by tricking them into downloading a, a Trojan, a piece of malicious software, looking on the computer for compromising photos, and then using those compromising photos to uh, blackmail uh, the victim into performing sex acts on camera for you. And the FBI busted a string of sextortionists last year, uh, people who, who call themselves ratters for remote access Trojan. If you Google ratters, you can find all kinds of horrific details about it, including the fact that ratters refer to their victims as slaves. Not knowing what your computer is doing makes you vulnerable not just to uh, 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 overpowering government surveillance, but uh, also to creeps. Uh, creeps who can exercise enormous power over you because after all, your computer knows everything about you. It hears everything you say. It sees everything you do. It knows who all of your friends are and what you're saying to them. It knows what your secrets are. It's with you in the bathroom. It's with you by the bedside. It is potentially your greatest ally, but also the worst traitor that we've ever known. So ultimately, competitive societies uh, rely on the right not just to use computers, but to know how they work, to describe critically how they work, 
to improve them regardless of whether or not that undermines some business's bottom line or some security apparatus's strategy for heightening their security. Ultimately, a free and fair society in the networked age requires not just freedom to use computers, but freedom to change computers, freedom to know computers, freedom to redistribute the changes that you've made to computers. So um, we are makers, right? That's why we're here, that's why we've come to Maker Fair. And so it's incumbent on us to be the vanguard to help people understand that what seems like a simple proposition, can't you just break this computer for me so that it does everything except for the one thing that's causing a problem is not a legitimate goal, that it's in fact just a pathway to um, systematic censorship, uh, undermining knowledge of how computers work, and spyware uh, and the introduction of vulnerabilities into our computers. We mustn't allow ourselves to yield on the score because this is not the beginning of the war on computers, or not the end of the war on computers, this is just the beginning. The last 15 years of copyright fights in, in which uh, powerful incumbent industries have said, make me a computer that does everything except for undermine my profit margin, um, was not the, the uh, a moment's foolishness on the way to the information age. It was instead a kind of harbinger of what we are about to face because as a society where everything we do involves computers and where everything we do in the future will require them, it seems obvious that every problem that we're going to have is also going to involve computers. And where problems involve computers and where people don't understand this fundamental thing about computers, that there's no way to make a computer Turing complete minus one, a computer that runs every program except for the program we don't like, and that the closest approximation is a computer with spyware on it out of the box. Every problem we have will give rise to the same call for a solution. A solution that is, make me a computer that's broken in a way that doesn't cause the problem. And that problem will be, that solution will be ineffective, as the solution has been ineffective uh, in, the, in the era of the copyright wars, 15 years of copyright wars, 15 years of expanded powers for rights holders to try to somehow limit copy, copying, and no good has come of it. Not only have we undermined the cause of, of progress and democracy and computers, but we've also done not a thing to stop copying. I mean, this is as hard as copying is ever gonna get. This day, July 7th, 2013, put it in your calendars, because this is the hardest day for the rest of time for copying, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren will sit around the Christmas table with you and say, tell me again, Grandpa, about July 17th, 2013. Tell me again, Grandma, about the day when you couldn't buy a blister pack of six thumb drives in the checkout aisle at Tesco's that could hold in each one of them all the music, all the movies, all the words, all the photos, all the oil paintings, and that sold six for a pound. Tell me again when networks were slow and hard to use and kind of clunky and not every OAP knew the magic incantation, movie name, space, bit torrent. Tell me again when copying was hard in 2013. So this, is, this, this shows you why the regulation of computers is an ineffective remedy at solving our problems. And maybe copying without control is a problem. There are people out there who think it's a legitimate problem and people who don't. But one thing I do know is that whether it's a problem or not, we haven't solved it. We haven't solved it by selectively breaking computers. And whatever problems come up in the future, we will not solve by selectively breaking computers. A Boeing 777 crashed at SFO this morning, San Francisco International Airport. I happen to fly a lot in Boeing aircraft. And I know that they are just flying Sun Solaris workstations in fancy aluminum cases with badly, badly secured SCADA controllers. And so it is in my interest as well as yours to make sure that our computers are well secured, well designed, and well understood. But our only process for establishing whether or not a security system works, the only experimental methodology for designing it, is to tell people how it works and see if they can see a flaw in your reasoning. Keeping security secret only makes security systems that work well against people who are stupider than you. And so as a result, or in, in summation, I think that it's really important that as makers, we not allow the sickness that's infected our conception of computers and their regulation for the last 15 years to spread. 
we must say no more. We must say no more opacity in the design of computers. No more legal mandates against telling people how computers work. No more legal mandates against improving computers. No more legal mandates against installing software of your choosing on computers. That it's not good for us as makers and it's not good for us as members of society. And we are potentially the only group who really understand this, what, what has heretofore been a kind of abstract theoretical nicety of how a computer works. And so it's our job to explain it to everybody else. And so I helped found a group in the UK called the Open Rights Group that I'm still involved with, and they work a lot like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who you may have heard of. It's openrightsgroup.org. We call, them, we call ourselves org. Uh, we have uh, conventions every year. We have mailing lists. Uh, we have an advisory committee. We have a lively volunteer group. And we, we need as many people as possible involved. Um, we ask for, I think it's a five or a month in voluntary subs. Uh, and um, no, you, know, you can see what the wages are paid to the executive director and, and the staff there. And they're very small. All of that money goes to campaigning, to educating MPs, to um, educating uh, regulators, and, and to intervening in quangos, uh, to countering uh, network censorship and device control measures and I hope you'll get involved with them in some way or another. I also hope you'll keep your eye out for similar organizations that you can work with. The Free Software Foundation that's been campaigning on the right to know how your computer works, to tell people how your computer works, to improve your computer and pass those improvements on to others for decades now. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, who established the principle in law that code is a form of speech and that restrictions on which code you can publish are restrictions on speech itself. Um, and for whom I worked for many years and who've been instrumental in keeping networks free and open for decades as well. I hope you'll, you'll, you'll find yourselves involved in those as well as in whatever other causes that matter to you because ultimately unless we can keep our networks and our devices free and open, we can't solve any of these other problems. But thank you very much. I'll take any questions you have. So we have about eight minutes for questions. Uh, any, and I'll remind you that... Thank um, you very much, Corey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, we have some time. We have about five, ten minutes for questions. Or? Okay. And I'll remind you a long rambling statement followed by what do you think of that is technically a question. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think we do need the mic because the acoustics are not. Yeah, great we're recording. Uh, yeah, we're recording all the talks. So, uh, don't you have some hope that fashion may solve all of this? I mean, I just saw all these people standing in line for an hour to look at David Bowie's outfits, mm -hmm. and I think that um, the the future may be that there will be small boutique computer makers who say. Uh, we will provide you a computer. I mean, a little bit like DuckDuckGo or whatever. Some, some private company that you pay a little bit for, mm -hmm. maybe a fee for service for a photo sharing tool, unlike Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole model of um, data mining will disappear, become out of fashion when people finally wake up what's actually going on. And just without regulation or deregulation or open or whatever, just simply small companies will emerge that provide people with a service that is completely private. Well, and, I, and, and that that may then become fashion when everyone wakes up and realizes that this is just better to pay a small amount of money for privacy sure. than to have everything, your whole future out there for Mark Zuckerberg to do whatever he likes with. Well, so Bruce Sterling, who, who writes for Make regularly, um, about now it's getting on to be 15 years ago, published something called the Viridian Manifesto, where he said that we'll never solve environmental problems until... Um, environmentalism, instead of being a, uh, a hair shirt or a deprivation, is seen instead as a luxury, right? And, and uh, I think that we've attained that, 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 there, that there are any number of luxury brands that build themselves as environmental as though that was a way of indulging yourself as opposed to a way of depriving yourself. And I think open and free have it in their power to do that too. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think that that is a place where fashion can certainly uh, play a part. Um, I think that, uh, in general, um, we have always uh, enjoyed the ability to shape the things that matter to us to our hand. That there's a certain dignity in taking something that was produced to be um, uh, the, uh, suited to the largest audience possible. Uh, and modifying it so that it's specifically suited to us. I mean, you know, this is the hemming your jeans or taking in your T-shirt or um, 
uh, painting the door of your flat or um, you know, rearranging your, your kitchen from the standard IKEA layout to something that suits you better or you know, choosing your own shower curtain, that all of those things, that, that suiting things to your taste, it, you, you see that kind of from prisoners who try to find ways to decorate their cells all the way up to you know, millionaires uh, and beyond and, and that, that urge to customize. I think that we sometimes hear when, when we talk about freedomness and openness, we sometimes hear that civilians don't want to know how their things work. You know, they don't want to take them apart and put them back together again. They just want them to work. And I think that there's some truth to that, but I don't think it's necessary that everybody want to take apart a device in order to have devices that are known to work well, that are known not to have any, any known vulnerabilities or any deliberate vulnerabilities in them through which we can be spied upon or manipulated or, or in, other, in some other way compromised. Um, I think it's enough that um, it be legal and then, as you say, I think a lot of small businesses will crop up to help those people who do want it as a niche basis. And for that, I take as my model phone unlocking, right? So phone unlocking is itself a fairly abstract thing, right? The, the rewriting firmwares, firmware of phones is actually arguably more specialized than loading your own software onto a PC. Uh, it's, a, it's a much narrower set of people who know how to do it. And yet, because phone unlocking is legal and because nobody wants locked phones, right? There, people may be indifferent to locked phones, but nobody woke up this morning and said, gosh, my phone works with too many carriers. I wish there was a way it would only run with one, right? Um, as a result, we have places all over that will unlock your phones. And so, you know, from my flat in Hackney, you walk down to the news agent and he'll unlock your phone. And then three doors over, there's a man with a card table in the dry cleaner who will unlock your phone. And if neither of those people are, are in, there's another bloke with a card table in Old Street Station who will unlock your phone for a fiver. And so that expertise is really widespread and the service is widely available. And the people I know who make most aggressive use of phone unlocking are not uh, bourgeois, uh, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, rich iPhone owners. Um, they're people on subsidy phones uh, where they've, they've taken it under contracts with their carriers who have very little money. People like the, the women who worked at my daughter's daycare who not only all had phones, many of them had phones that had two SIM cages and were always looking for the best bargain because they're very cash sensitive, they're very, they're very price sensitive. And so they want to have a phone that has one SIM for texting because there's a carrier that's giving them free texting and another SIM for calling because there's a carrier that does free calling. And they're the most aggressive adopters of this new technology. It's not, you know, middle class nerds. It's, it's working class uh, uh, young women from, from uh, um, Hackney and, and Bethnal Green who are adopting this stuff most aggressively in, in, in my neighborhood. So I, I do think that where the regulation that prohibits knowing how devices work and changing them gets out of the way, that very quickly not only is that knowledge diffused, but it's also diffused to the people who need it the most. It's, that, that advantage is not captured solely by uh, the privileged. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have time to get to take another question? Okay, we can take another question and then we will have uh, yeah. Q&A after the panel, actually. One yeah. more question. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, and we're going to have a panel this afternoon about education, but I was wondering if you wanted, you've ta talked a lot about legal regulation. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to add anything about what role education and curriculum might have in this yeah. situation. Education and curriculum. So uh, the best maker thing for kids I've ever seen is a place called makerkids.ca makerkids in Toronto where I'm from. And uh, you know that saying in shops, you break it, you bought it? Uh, they have a you break it, you own it uh, policy. So when kids come in, I went in last summer with my daughter who was four at the time and my nephew Jackson who was uh, five and a half. And, um, they said, you know, over here, we have a pile of, of semi-working electronic toys from, you know, the, the charity shop. And over here, we have a wood shop, a metal shop, saws, screwdrivers, uh, um, sort of everything, hammers, uh, you know, whatever it is. Pick a toy and take it apart. So Jackson walked over and he picked up a Wally -E toy and he took it to bits as far as he could go and then kept taking it to bits and kept taking it to bits down to you know, some pretty fine components. And the, the facilitator there came over and he said, so uh, now what are you gonna do? 
He said, oh, I'm gonna put it back together. So he starts putting it back together, this and there. But on the way he said, you know, that uh, muscle man action bloke, I wanna put his arms on. And the guy said, great, if you put this back together and change it in such a way that it's no longer recognizable as the original toy that came out of the wrapping, you get to take it home. So let's figure it out. And so out came all of the tools. Well, let's try hot glue gunning. Eh, that didn't work so well. Oh, well, here's the drill press. Let's drill out the arm, and we'll, we'll use a, a wood screw to go right through, and then we'll hot glue gun that. Oh, well, that worked on this arm. Well, well let's try something else on that arm. And it was it, the motivation, the, the twin motivations of the sheer joy of taking stuff apart and putting it back together combined with the you know, absolute venality of six-year-olds to own more uh, junky plastic toys um, was it was, it was kid, you know, kid catnip. It was, it was total preschooler crack. Uh, and um, uh, that was an amazing educational exercise. And like I said at the start of this, the gateway drug to making is breaking. Um, and you know, uh, breaking in an environment where nobody punishes you um, and where um, you can gracefully recover from your failures is the best way to encourage people to, to break aggressively, to break freely, to break without reservation, you know, to, to you know, dance as though there were no one watching, to break as though there were no one watching, um, and, and uh, to, to really go mad. I mean, control Z is such a powerful thing in software making, right? Because, you know, the, 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 you can, you, I, I, I'm old enough that I learned to type on a teletype terminal, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a typewriter, but it was a teletype, so we had um, a roll of brown paper in. And when you type the key on the keyboard, uh, a daisy wheel struck the paper uh, and made the mark. And um, you couldn't over strike your type because there wasn't, a, an over, there wasn't any way to change it. And as a result, typing was a slow, painful process to learn in 1977. Um, but once you can backspace, once you can control Z, once you can try, move this here and then move it there, learning becomes a lot easier. Now we don't have a control Z in hardware, but what we do have is cheap hardware, right? If, of all the, the things that the WTO and the kind of the, the drowning in plastics world has given us, the one blessing it's given us is that there is a bottomless supply of things that are destined for the landfill that we might as well just break uh, on the way. And, and in the same way that uh, Mr. Jalopy living in LA gave him access to an endless supply of $100 junkers that he could break to learn to be a mechanic, living anywhere in the developed world gives you an endless supply of semi-broken electronics that you can break further to learn how to do that stuff too. And on the way, boy, there's so many other lessons to learn. Natalie Jermajenko with her fer feral robot dogs, every year she buys a, a huge sack of um, semi-robotic electronic dogs from Toys R Us and brings them to her, to her electrical engineering undergrads. And the first thing she do, does is have them take them apart and examine the solder joints. And if the solder joints are regular, then they were done by robots. And if they're irregular, they were done by children. And by marking the country of manufacture and the type of manufacture year on year, she can track child labor trends in the Pacific Rim longitudinally. And, and also see which manufacturers are using subcontractors that adopt ethical and non-ethical manufacturing uh, uh, standards. And this is such an eye-opening thing for kids, uh, let alone grown-ups. And she, she's done this with kids as young as 16 and had enormously great uh, experiences with it. And a, a, in general, I mean, I think it would, it's a totally non-controversial thing to say that, you know, IST, uh, ICT pr curriculum is just balls. But, um, you know, it, it, it's one thing to just say, well, it's just balls, and another thing to say, well, what has worked out there in the field? And I, these are a few things that I know that have worked. So shall we uh, have the panel? Thank you all. Yeah, thank you very much, Corey. That was great. So, um, Eva.